Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my goal here is to find the exceptional people in their field and interview them and ask them questions and hopefully get them to say uh, that's a good question. It means I've asked them something that uh, stirs up some new thoughts or uh, some interesting angle they may not have covered. So my guest today is uh, Adam Arkin. He's a senior faculty scientist at University of California, Berkeley. We're going to be talking about environmental genomics and molecular ecosystems biology. So Adam, welcome. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I just spoke uh, a couple of compound words here, environmental genomics and molecular ecosystems biology, but what what does that mean? How do you define those terms? Yeah, so you know, my interest has always been in how microbes, um, which are bacteria, they are um, archaea, which is another, another kingdom of life, on how viruses uh, transform our environment and impact um, their processes. And those processes include ourselves, our own health and the like. So the type of work that I do is about how do we track and characterize the groups of these microbes and how they operate together to get their jobs done and how can we intervene to have them do things that they would not do otherwise that were beneficial for us. So in what context are you studying the archaea? Like inside the human body are there some or inside of animals or? Uh, there are in fact, <laughs> there are in fact archaea inside us and inside uh, other animals, especially, uh, especially ruminants and things like that. Um, but we, a lot of our, our largest projects work in, um, in terrestrial environments, mostly the subsurface, um, the, uh, the shallow subsurface of, um, of a watershed, for example. And we work out, uh, out behind Oak Ridge, Tennessee a lot um, uh, in, Oak Ridge, uh, sorry, out behind Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is a place where they made uh, nuclear weapons, among other things. And so there's a field behind there that's contaminated with uranium and with the highest level of nitrates on Earth with organics and other metals. And um, the microbes that are there can breathe those metals and can reduce that nitrate and transform it into things that are otherwise relatively harmless or at least immobile. I mean, they can't get into the water table and get downstream. And we're interested in, in how those factors constrain and change these services that microbes provide in these, in these otherwise productive environments. Uh, so right now, a lot okay. of that would be, you know, out in the field. Although we've done studies inside, you know, of, of human gut microbes. We've done studies of plant-associated microbes uh, for agriculture, uh, things like that. So w what in particular are you trying to figure out? Do you, do you understand fully all their interactions in their environment? And is that what you want to figure out? Or like what, <laughs> what are some of the particulars? Well, well we, we, can, we can break it down to two different things. One is applied issues and the other are basic issues. Um, let's start out with the applied because people can often um, have compassion for that. <laughs> so for things like um, the watersheds, there are things like how do we decontaminate water? Um, how do we better sequester carbon? How do, we, um, how, do we, how do we make sure that the metals can't get into our water, our, our water um, supplies and, and the like? And the idea is that we could possibly feed these microbes or fertilize them in various ways so they could, they could improve our environments. And um, this is related to the agricultural applications where you want to use these microbes as amendments and they can mobilize nutrients to the plant. They can protect them from pathogens. They can increase the resilience to things like drought. Um, uh, and, and they can improve the carbon utilization so that the carbon that is sequestered by the plant is maintained in the soil, thereby reducing greenhouse gases. And, and so that's one set of applications that are out in the environment. Other ones that have to do with things like animals or, or us, we would love to build microbiomes that are not invasible by pathogens, that, um, that reduce our own greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that uh, provide us better nutri nutrition, better utilize our food. Um, protect us from um, other diseases, for example. Now, what, what stops us from doing that is huge gaps in our basic knowledge. Um, you know, a few things that people might be interested to know that in a gram of soil, there are about 10 to the sixth, about a million microbes and about 10,000 different species. 
of which, you know, on the order of, you know, a few thousand are, are extremely important for the current functioning of that gram of soil. Um, it's, it's as dense, if not more so, in your gut. Now, in the soil, we can only culture, bring into the laboratory and dissect, we can only culture about, you know, 90% of those, maybe a little bit less than 90% in, in some cases. And most of those, you know, we, we can't study, we, have, we, have, we don't have a history of studying them. And so a lot of their gene content, a lot of their genome, how they, how they program them, we don't know what it does. And so uh, a lot of what my group does is figure out how to get them from those strange locations, from, from the subsurface, from, from uh, the ocean, from a plant root, from a human, and bring them into the laboratory and scalably, meaning with very, at very high rates, uh, characterize how their genes work across a wide array of conditions. So we can begin to link sort of causally how these organisms work with what they can do for us in those environments. You know, in isolation or even, you know, I, I can see you sequencing all the genomes of all the bacteria are present, but when they're all together and these thousands of species are interacting and probably altering each other's gene expression and you know, who knows what, adapting, et cetera. I mean, how do you get that picture without studying them all together and how do you even begin to model that? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. So one of the big, one of the big open questions uh, in, in the field is, um, you know, how are these organisms communicating with each other? What, how do they depend on each other? And um, how do we infer uh, those interactions? Um, and we do that uh, first by using methodologies that allow us to observe them in situ, um, both their genomes and their gene expression. And we can do that in space and time and we can infer, we can't, we don't get, we don't get a direct measurement. We can infer from that, you know, who appears together more than random chance and who, which genes are expressed together more than random chance and so on. And from that build up a picture of likely who's talking to whom. We can then use that information to make inferences using what we know about the mechanisms of how energy is used by bugs, by these, by these bacteria, don't leave. Um, uh, to think about metabolically how they're linked together in various ways. But those are all hypotheses things that we think are going on. So a lot of what we do in the laboratory is once we have, um, you know, when we, when we make a, a, a laboratory culture, we often enrich it from a natural situation. So we take a sample from the outside world. Um, we take a, a gram of soil, literally a gram of soil, and we will put that into a media in the laboratory and we'll grow what's on it. Now, it's not a natural situation, not exactly natural. So you might grow it in a large number of different conditions that are representative of chemistries that we observe in the wild, right? So high nitrate and low pH and high uranium for, or so on. And all those bugs will grow together. And because they're in a more contained environment, we can measure them much, much more deeply. We can measure their full genomes. We can measure the exometabolomics uh, with, with, our, with a colleague of mine, Trent Northern. We can measure gene expression and so on. And it gives us an even finer picture of who talks to whom under what condition. And then ultimately, when we tear apart that, that consortium of bugs, look at the individuals, we can put them back together in so-called synthetic communities, test hypotheses about can they actually talk to each other when they're done one-to-one. -one. Now, we have done that cycle a number of times. And our group and others have shown that for a lot of the communities we've looked at for, to date, most of the large community dynamics can be described by a much smaller number of pairwise interactions. That is, I can predict what the larger community will do from a smaller number of pairwise interactions among community members. And well, that's so, good. yeah, which is good, right? I mean, it, mean, it means we're not in, in huge amounts of trouble here. Um, but, but that said, uh, those are only mild, right now, we have not proven that even doing that for an in situ situation, something which is really in your gut or really in the soil, is very predictive. We get general trends correct, but precise behavior. But that shows you, I guess, like vital pairs, maybe, right? Exactly. It, 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 comes, it, brings us, it brings us the major levers. These are the guys who are like the most responsible. Exactly right. I, I've heard that um, viruses, like in the oceans, and I don't know about soil, but they're responsible for a major cycling of the bacteria that are there. Um, how does the you know the viral dynamic impact your studies, and your work? Yeah, you know, um, viruses are are major everywhere. Anywhere that life can be, <laughs> life can be a virus can be. You know, um, we uh, we work with a fellow named T.C. Onstad at Princeton many years ago. He's a very famous um, microbial ecologist and microbiologist, and he was opening a, a, a rock wall 2.4 kilometers towards the center of the earth in a South African gold mine. Gold mine, gold mine. And behind that wall, he, there's a trickle of water. 
And then pickle of water, we did a metagenome. And in that metagenome, there was one organism, uh, which was this, this huge genome bacterium, um, which we get to name, uh, the sulfur rudis odaxviator, which odaxviator is called bold traveler. And the, the sulfur rudis means um, sulfur reducing uh, sausage. And in that organism's genome was an integrated prophage. And the phage would have infected it at some point in the past. So phage are everywhere, and they're incredibly important for carbon cycling and for controlling communities in various ways. And we're just beginning to understand their essential role in the, in the shallow subsurface. But they're extremely numerous in the, in, the, in the soil, which is right below the surface of the earth, where the plant roots are. They're incredibly important in your gut. They're important in the making of cheese. Um, they, they are, they're a major element of, of the community dynamics as a whole. They, they have both detrimental effects, meaning that they can attack an organism and kill it, but they can also confer immunity. They can integrate into the host genome and confer immunity and support the organism against other attacks. And they actually are responsible for gene flow. They bring genes along with them to, to add functionality to their hosts so they can be partly beneficial at times. So they're a, they're a, um, they're a complex member of the community uh, and really interesting. Uh, another interesting story about phage, and I think this is worth talking about, is that um, they've been with bacteria so long that bacteria have figured out ways, I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit here, but let's just, let's just use loose language for a moment. Uh, the bacteria have figured out how to um, co-opt them and they, they have evolved, they have been able to trap phage, behead them more or less so they can't package DNA and just use their tail and their little landing legs as sort of a spear to throw at other microbes. So now the phage is no longer autonomous. The bacterium has something called the bacteriosin, which is a, it's a little, called a phage tail-like bacteriosin. And what it can do is it can take this partial phage and use it to kill other bacteria directly. Really? No. Yeah. Not, isn't that the coolest thing you ever heard of? And how, how does it use it? Does the bacteria like vesiculate and form a holder for it and literally use it as a weapon or does it oh, somehow dude. like bind, bind the tails no. to its membrane? Yeah. Well, actually this, this is, this is actually wild. So a couple of, so, so, the, so no, it has to kill itself to do so. <laughs> it actually, it actually laces its own. It's, it, so it's, so you remember that bacteria are clonal populations, right? That means an individual cell doesn't have much meaning. It's the population that does. And so, a small fraction of the population that feels stress will express the, this, this, this PTLB, this fake tail like bacteriosin, and it will lyse itself to release it. And then when it kills the other cells, the enemy cells, so to speak, calling them enemies is anthropomorphizing, but you know, these, these other cells, um, uh, it feeds the rest of the population who's present. Now, now, this is not the only thing that can happen. For example, there are versions of these PTLBs called isis elements which are contractile, and they're loaded with a protein. And when they attack the target cell, they inject this protein. And these have been found in organisms that inhabit the human gut <coughs> and in insects. And in insects, that these things do is they will, they will inject proteins that will transform insect cells, will attack insect cells, and make a better environment for the microbes inside the gut of the insect. Well, literally, how do the bacteria use this, this virus piece? Like, Oh, if you literally it, it, are looking at it, what does it oh, look like? Yeah, it's, it, in a sense, really exciting. In a sense, it's really boring. So literally, the, 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 there, there'll be some fraction of the population, some small number of cells in a group of, group of bacteria that are present that will suddenly begin to express these sets of genes that will self-assemble into what looks like a phage tail. No head, just a phage tail. And then when that's, that's constructed inside the cell, the cell will lyse itself. The cell will explode and it will release these particles into, into the surround. And these, these tails will then diffuse around. And because they're very specific, because they can recognize specific cell targets, when they, when they, when they attach to those targets, they, even just one of them, just one of them, when it attaches to a target, will poke a hole in it, its it thought in its membrane and depolarize it and kill that cell. So it's launched like a, like, like a diffusible missile. It's not directed. There's no force behind it. It diffuses towards its target but enough of them are released that it will find its target. You mean just, just the, they passively release it, what, radially in all directions? Yes. And, yep. Hmm. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's another type of, of system that's like this. It's called uh, type 6 secretion. And, and in that case, uh, instead of making a viral particle, it's making a, a structure on the surface that has an injector region. And so literally in that case, 
it gets up beside its target cell. And when it's next to it, somehow it senses that it is. And this injector pokes a hole right through that target cell and injects proteins right into it. Into, in, into it. And then because the two cells are linked, the cell that's right next door gets the benefit. Um, so one of the big questions in the microbial ecology is exactly this. There are, there, are, there are predation mechanisms like this that are exactly cell-cell contact, like type 6 secretion. There are things like these like, like phase channel bacteriosins, which are very, very large particles that don't diffuse very far because they're large, right, that are released all around you and then alt- altruistically. I mean, you have to sacrifice po- part of your population to get the job done. And then there are small molecule antibiotics. A lot of our antibiotics are, are, are antibiotics that are made by bacteria, Streptococcus and others, um, Streptomyces and others, rather, that, that can make these natural products that can also kill other bacteria, right? So when do you use a small molecule? When do you use a phage like bacteriosin? And when do you use a, a, a type 6 secretion system? Under what conditions is one or the other optimal? And we don't know. But they're all different ways that cells have, have, have invented to um, interact negatively with each other. Well, I was thinking if uh, there's a lot of touch now. Um, so it seems like these bacteria have like, not only they can sense their external environment, but they sense the proximity. Maybe they're using chemical gradients, or I, I don't know what they use, but they can, I mean, they can, I guess, yeah, if the gradient is strong enough, they can sense their proximity to another target cell. And then like you said, literally go right next to it and inject directly into it. Is it, that's one mechanism? Yeah, well, one of the things you think to realize is that bacteria are very, very small, and their ability to directionally sense or move in, a, in an organized fashion is, can be hard. Um, so the first thing is they can sense often um, a chemical gradient. Um, they have to do that by moving. Uh, so chemotaxis is a methodology for doing that, where they can sense gradients. Um, they can sense density. Uh, <coughs> so if cells are given, above a given density, they can secrete a quorum signal. And that signal can tell them there's a lot of this cell type around. Um, they don't might not know where it is, but they know there's a lot of it around because this molecule builds up in the in the surrounds around it. Um, it is much less clear how they can sense physically being next to each other. So there are cells that have sensors that are about when two cells touch, but they tend to be self-sensing and not other sensing. So right now it's not clear how they sense when you're right next to each other. My guess is is that it's mechanically triggered. The 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 element is already poised and ready to fire, and the cell, when another cell bumps into it, it literally triggers a trap and, 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 and it, and it, and it, and it um, gets punctured. Um, so I don't know. There's a whole bunch of different mechanisms by which they do this thing, but it doesn't seem like it's, it's as directed as you might think a tiger would be. Like a tiger sights an antelope and just zips on after it and has a tracking mechanism in its brain so it can get to it, right? So I don't right think bacteria works that way. A, a typical non-target cell put, put this bacteria in this environment in farm state with non, you know, traditionally non-targetable cells and see if they interact and then put it in with its preferential ones and, you know, it should interact. Couldn't you do that experiment to see how, how much sense it is going on? How specific? Yeah, I mean, a good example, they take these, they take these face tail like bacteriosins, they tend to be very, very specific. They don't tend to be very broad host range. So when you do culture them with non-target cells, you still make the bacteriosin a lot of the time. If you're under, just if you're under stress, you make it because you, what else are you going to do? No, it's um, not the making of it, it's the actual physical puncture. Right. Of the is, it, is it that because the, I'm just going to say, the weapon is shaped, it'll only target the right cell? Or oh. is it that there's sensing going on and that it only will try to, you know, puncture the right cell? No, uh, no. So the, the, um, for the, in the case of the PTLBs, for example, or for a phage for that matter, you know, they have their molecular, they have molecular um, recognition elements. So literally on the tail of a phage, um, this is not the only place, but on the tail of a phage, there's a protein that can recognize specific elements of the target cell called receptors. And these may be parts of the, um, parts of the polysaccharide layer. It may be uh, surface channels, proteins embedded in the membrane um, and other things. And if, for example, the bacterium is target mutates and doesn't make that sugar anymore, or mutates that protein, that phage can't attack it anymore. It won't find it. And it's not a matter of distance sensing. Literally, it bumps into it. If it bumps into it, it may like lock in the key. If the key goes in, then it kills the cell. And if the key doesn't go in, it bounces off it and ends up in place else. So the puncture is a secondary mechanism. It's like seek, dock, puncture. That's right. And and the seek seek is a random walk. (laughs) Okay, well, I mean, there definitely could be gradients, but it depends on specific 
Right, right, exactly. Um, you know, in, cool. in contrast, in contrast, antibiotics, you know, like, like when you make a small molecule antibiotic, like a lactam or something, right? Um, these also are diffusive. They don't have any, any smarts to them, right? But their mechanism of, a, their mechanism, mechanism of action is very generic. So you can have a broad host range, meaning it's not very specific to who it, who it, who, who it kills. Lots of people are killed by the beta lactam. Um, so, so some of these things are very specific. Some of them are very, are, are more broad. If you're going back to, I don't know if you talked about this, but um, when you said that uh, certain bacteria will chop the head off, I guess you mean the capsid off of, uh, of a virus. And are they doing this internally? Are they, I guess, they're oh, allowing that, virus to have anti them? Yeah, in, in, in this case, I, I meant that very, you know, very evolutionarily. That is, that these PTLBs have been trapped for, for, for eons. So I mean that long ago in, in, in dark, dark history, a phage tried to attack this cell and, and somehow got trapped. And then over many, 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 many years, they've evolved into these PTLBs. Um, so they, they, are, they clearly came from certain types of phage, but they're no longer phage, and they weren't phage any time in our history, in, 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 any time in our recent history there. Well, so they think so they've endogenized, the phage has endogenized in that bacteria, and then the bacteria, quote unquote, knows and has the programming on how to, um, how to make this particular spear, which yep. I guess morphologically was part of a, of a virus that infected it a long time ago. I'm sorry, could you ask that again? You're is breaking up the cell. The, 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 um, sorry, so the cell itself, the bacteria itself is, because it has some of the viral DNA, you know, in it now, um, it knows how to manufacture. It's, it's, there's like a biogenesis of this, you know, spear mechanism or part of the virus mechanism. It's like the cell itself That's, is making this and it's yeah, migrating to the external membrane. That's exactly right. So, so the, 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 the evolution history of this is that sometime in the, in the distant past, many, many, many generations ago, many moons ago, a phage uh, attacked a bacterium. Generally, they'd be lysogenic phage. They end up inside the genome. And uh, it got trapped there. And then over time, uh, the cell evolved to um, you know, delete all the genes involved in the ability to package DNA, to shorten up, a bun- you know, to shorten up and, and shear off a bunch of extraneous materials. And it built the regulatory machinery so it could turn on the spear when it wanted to turn on the spear. Um, and so all those things evolved over time and are constantly evolving to optimize itself for growth in different environments. So yes, it has internal to itself the genetic blueprint of this of this of this PTLB, which in the distant past used to be a virus. Okay, that's a lot more clear. I got it. Okay. And then um, backing up now, you know, you mentioned, I believe you mentioned that. Obviously, let's say we have a, a contaminated site and we want to remediate it. It's, it's probably not going to be enough or not smart to just, let's say, culture a certain bacteria that eats a contaminant in a contaminated area and just, you know, saturate the area with it. You might want to include, let's say, a phage to keep it in check or a phage after a period of time after it's consumed all the bad material and the phage, like, calls its numbers back to normal or maybe some other partner that keeps it in check. Right. So I think, I think that, you know, this is, a, this is another really good question and it, and it comes down to a few things. So one thing is, is that for, in some cases, you're just using the bug as a catalyst. It has, so it make, it makes some enzyme, the enzyme does something cool. So you just put a bunch of bug down so it can have that activity. But, um, you know, uh, number one, it might not be very active unless it has the proper partners that we were talking about before. Like they need other guys to drive them forward. And so one, you may need to construct a community so they can actually do their job well. Second, you may need to construct a community so you can displace the existing community that's there and you can persist for long enough to do your job and not be outcompeted with a community that's present. Third, you might have to engineer for containment, which is what you're talking about. And in containment, you want to make sure that if you put something down, you can take it back out again. And phage are good ways of doing that, for example. They can be used to possibly remove uh, organisms from, from, from an environment. And that can also be used in therapeutic context. So you can use a phage to remove a pathogen, for example, from the lung of a CF patient or from the gut of someone who's suffering from acinetobacter um, or an enterococci. And, uh, and so phage are community editing mechanisms or community eraser mechanisms. And there's lots of groups now working on how do you design and build phage and phage cocktails to be maximally effective against, for example, um, multi-drug, resist- multi-drug resist- resistant bacteria or how do you um, rebalance uh, organisms at the root of a plant so you get maximum nu- nutrient availability and so on? Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, have you had the need, I guess, for, you know, I don't want to call it AI, but 
you know, uh, tremendous computation. You know, I mean, I, I guess you need tremendous computation to figure out the dynamics of all this or, yeah, you know, with I mean, your so, pair model, is that, can we get close enough? Um, well, you know, in, in, in all seriousness, you know, we, we use lots of computation all the time. Um, there's a lot, first of all, we're making lots of different types of measurements. There are chemi chemical measurements, there are hydrological measurements, there are sequencing measurements, there's activity measurements. Um, and all of those measurements require us to process that data through models that turn the actual primary information into predictions about biology. This, cell, this, this, this species has these genes with these functions and grows at this rate, just so we know what they are, right? So that's already like, you know, terabytes of data and 40 algorithms and lots of statistics and oh my God. Um, but now if we want to make predictions, like real predictions, like, hey, let's, let's predict what would happen if we intervene. We have to use machine learning models that make that happen. And those are things like iterative random forests or um, various sorts of regressions, um, uh, uh, sometimes neural right. networks. And yeah, we use a lot of those things. And one of the big challenges we have in science today is that when I get a paper to review, there might be, you know, as I said, a, a, few, a, few, a few terabytes of data. There might be over 80 algorithms and then a whole bunch of machine learning, which requires advanced statistics to understand. And it's really hard to evaluate the quality of that science or its sensitivity to what was chosen. So one of the other big projects that I run is something called the K-Base. This is, this is the Department of Energy Systems Biology Knowledge Base, where we really help scientists collaborate to do this, this sophisticated, multi-omic, multi-scale modeling of biology in a framework which allows them to share the results, to test them against each other, and to make sure that everything's reproducible, reusable, re-executable, and testable. Because yeah, you have to use these algorithms to do it. And yeah, they're very sensitive to the data sets that you put into them. And then um, this is a little bit of a side question, but what do you think is the dynamic, let's say in you know, the human gut between, and you know, longitudinally over a long period of time between hmm. a given bacteria and a phage that preys on it? Like, why would a bacteria, for instance, be stable in a population in our gut over a year's time or even a month's time? And it's not increasing like crazy, but it's also not being killed completely by, let's say, a phage that preys on it. So what do you think like virus bacteria dynamics look like long term? What's happening? Well, I mean, it's a really good question. And I think there's lots of types of dynamics. And the most famous example of predator prey stability is the fox rabbit stability, right? Where, you know, a you know, the, you have foxes and rabbits living in a forest and rabbits breed out. And as they breed out, the foxes eat them. As the foxes eat them, the fox population grows. If it grows too much, the rabbits stop, stop breeding or there's not enough of them. And so then, the, then if the, the rabbit populations go down, the fox populations go down and they sort of balance out at some steady state or they oscillate over time, you know? Um, and I think a lot of that is what's going on inside the gut is you have these sort of successions that occur over time. Um, the other thing is, is that, is that, you know, sometimes the, the phage aren't very virulent. I mean, you and I are full of viruses right now, full of adenoviruses, and they don't hurt us. They just propagate at some rate. And, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of this sort of low-level propagation. The virus move is it, it, eating some fraction of cells, not a lot of them. It's not incredibly virulent. It's, it's just causing a low level of infection, um, which keeps us in check in a sense, right? A little, it keeps us a little bit lower than normal. Um, uh, and then you have to recognize that we're an open system. So we're constantly receding our mi microbiome by what we eat um, and, and, and uh, by feeding it uh, um, uh, right now the foods that we eat. So the dynamic is complicated. It's about this balance between you know, predation and prey. It's about the virulence of the predator and the, and the strength of that predator. And it's about the receding rates from outside, uh, which, which causes this balance to occur. Um, and when you have dysbiosis, when you have the invasion of a pathogen or you, you have a bad phage that gets in there, you can become very sick because the balance is, made, is, is destroyed. So there's, yeah, I guess, you know, in order for these, um, for any stability to occur, there has to be dynamics that keep the system, you know, where it's at. And then if it gets disturbed, right, yeah, sometimes it goes to a new regime that's unfortunately stable and it's dysbiotic, or, you know, maybe it comes back to its previous state. So I guess that's some of the, the population dynamics like in our guts, for instance. That's right. And so there's, there's, there's a whole field of, of population ecology and ecodynamics eco that discusses the, the, the critical interactions that must occur to get this sort of, um, this sort of these sort of, um, you know, these, these properties of communities that arise. And you pointed out that it takes a community to do things. So the certain structures of communities, diversities and interactions amongst these guys that lead to 
um, um, you know, resistance, meaning the ability to, to, to stand against an external perturbation and maintain your activity and population density, or resilience, which is that if a perturbation occurs, you respond to it, but if the perturbation goes away, you come back again. Um, or robustness, where if I perturb you, yeah, you move, but not very much, and you respond, and you, and you come back very, very quickly. Um, and all these different properties, people have come up with theories for how you should configure yourself to, to have one or more of these properties as part of your community. And people are sort of figuring out how much that applies um, in the real world. But I suspect that as you pointed out, that these are, these are, these, they're, they're attractor states, things where essentially you're set up to stay where you are and to stay in this homeostatic region of our, of our health. And it takes a pretty big perturbation, some pretty big bad actor to come in and take us off our, our, take us off our chair. Um, and, and, once you remove the bad actor, maybe you recede because you're an open system and we're eating healthy things and it comes into our body and it works, but that can cause a real shift in your overall dynamic. I think that's, that type, of, dynamic, that, that type of, of analysis is just becoming possible with real mi- mi- microbiome work um, and is most advanced. So I, I, can, I can envision, you know, next time, well, in, in a case where someone's sick and there's dysbiosis, instead of antibiotic, uh, they give like a very specific prebiotic that would feed the bacteria they want back. Probiotic, which would be the bacteria they want, again, uh, phage that is counter to the other, you know, the predominant enemy or predominant pathogen right then. And then with all these nudges, you'd probably get back to a, a healthy state much faster and more stably than like, wham, with a, you know, an antibiotic or just, you know, a single type of therapy. Yeah, I, I, th- I, mean, I think you're right. But I'm, I'm, I, I, of course, I'm putting my career on the line for that. I, I think that's true. And I think there's a lot of companies that have risen over the past decade that, are, that think the same thing. I think it's a very hard problem, um, but there's certainly evidence that we're making progress on that and that it's beginning to work. Um, but it's, we're, still, we're still, I think, in the early days of this. But uh, I do think it's going to be extremely effective to uh, engineer in the way you're talking about. Well, very good, Adam. This, this is a great call. I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, but we're out of time. What, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Uh, a great, a great place to start is just is just um, uh, uh, looking for me at UC Berkeley. I have a number of websites, but genomics.lbl.gov is my na- my main website. Um, I would urge you to look at um, a couple other websites associated with my work. One is kbase.us, which is where we do our computation and keep our data and build communities to talk about this stuff. And then my one of the large projects we talked about on this call is called Enigma. Uh, and that's at the Oak Ridge, Tennessee site, the Oak Ridge National Lab site, and that's enigma.lbl.gov. Well, very good. Adam, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was great to be here. Thank you for taking the time. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.